The Dark Wheel by Robert Holmstock. They had been trading now for three standard months, and their cobra craft, the Nemesis, was scarcely recognisable as the battered, tomb-like place of trader Henry Bell. With new insignia, new welding, new colour, and the pods and swellings of the armaments housings, it began to look like a fighter. Three months a trader, and not for one hour of one day of those months had Alex forgotten the reason behind this way of life. Something, someone, disguised as a trader, had killed his father, and done its best to kill him. His father had led a double life, and accordingly, to the oldest relic in the galaxy, had deputised his son to follow in his star path. Alex Ryder was not about to fail his father in that wish. There were so many questions, so much grief, so much anger, and for Alicia too, although the Teorgian woman rarely showed the emotion that Alex sensed was bubbling just below the surface of her cool, wise-cracking exterior. They were facing a task together, a task of growing, of becoming strong. There would have to be a time of waiting, and both were accepting that time with as much silent patience as they could muster. But it was not easy, not easy for either of them. And for Alex, with blood on his hands at last, not easy at all. The skirmish with the two pirate ships had scraped the paint a little and loosened several hull plates, necessitating a trip to a service satellite, where, because of their bounty hunting, the work would almost certainly be performed free of charge. Though this had been Alex's first solo combat, it had not been their first battle. Alicia would have qualified for dangerous status had she been eligible for a rating. As it was, her rating, on the evidence of the Nemesis skirmishing, had been assigned to Alex. Now, for the first time, Alex felt he had taken a substantial step towards proving that he genuinely deserved that particular classification. Still, at the astrogation console, he guided the ship to within a thousand kilometres of the surface of the dying world, so close that the planet filled everything in the forward vision screen. At dead slow approach speed, he finally looped around, and there, slowly spinning before them, a glittering metal cube was the space station, its access bay a wide, rotating mouth. Oh, for a docking computer, Alex murmured as he began to match rotation and slowly approached. Waste of money, Alicia chided. If you can't dock without losing your paintwork, you shouldn't be in space. Alex was a great flyer, but sneaking neatly into the reception bay of a Coriolis station was his greatest weakness. He made it, though, and once inside the vast hangar space, magnetic traction drew the nemesis slowly to a vacant berth. Autocom links snaked out and clamped to its hull. Alex watched the bustle in the great, brightly lit void. The customs ships, the police vipers, the advertising modules, the repair modules, all moving slowly in the cube space. Touting for business, Alicia hid in the escape pod as usual. Alex declared his cargo and received confirmation of his bounty killings and notification of his bonus. 30 credits! That exactly covered the cost of a new missile. When all the check-ins, logins, and identity verifications had been run, Alicia emerged from hiding. The escape capsule had been their first priority and they'd brought one second hand for 400 credits. They didn't intend to use it anyway, except to screen off Alicia's unfortunate and unwelcome origins. Now began the routine of business, selling, and then deciding where to trade next and what to buy to take with them. Trading is very much a hit-and-miss profession, with certain high-demand, high-turnover products. A small profit can usually be guaranteed. Foodstuffs, textiles, simple machinery, simple luxuries. But the ship's running costs and occasional space skirmish can soon eat up such profits, making the whole exercise essentially worthless. There's no way of knowing trade prices at other systems. Each planetary state jealously guards its stock market information, and there are heavy penalties for faxing the market prices of any item beyond orbit space. Prices change, too. Speculators lurk in every system, no matter how poor. That ton of frozen bladder lash that would have fetched eight credits a month ago at Sainzala against a buying price of three from its homeworld Riort will suddenly be worth only two. 
The demand for blood alash had not lessened. The speculators had made a secret killing and fixed up the market. Hit and miss. Alex and Alicia had been lucky so far. They'd carried Valgorn mind silk between Rexeb and Inera and doubled their initial hundred credits. They'd ferried the gold flake scales of Garetian reptiles and only just covered their costs. They'd supplied twenty tons of sunflower seeds to the grotesque amphibioid inhabitants of Byerl, to whom sunflower seeds were a particular delicacy, only to find that a mass mind-induced mutation had occurred through the entire planetary population, changing their taste buds. The search was now on for the new delicacy to delight the palates of the Byerlians. Lubrication oil had come close, lavender scented tissue paper, but somewhere there was a real profit to be made. One day, one year. Moving machinery from high tech worlds to middle tech worlds was also unexpectedly profitable, and demand for luxuries was always high on evolving industrial worlds. But Caesar, the Shanna Skilk furs, bought at 30 galactic credits the ton, were likely to be their best bet yet. Alex nervously called up the buying price at Xizor. He whooped with triumph as he saw that he and Alicia had tripled their money. This time, in the hit-and-miss game, they had hit lucky. They sold the furs without trouble. Then Alex called up the price list of Xizor of ship and armaments equipment. The new missile was the standard 30 credits. He ordered one and a small robot, which scuttled off to fetch the permitted weaponry. Beam laser were 1,000 credits, and the temptation to invest in one was strong. The price of the fuel and the cargo scoop, which the nemesis so badly needed, was extortionately high at 525 credits, but an energy bomb cost nearly twice as much. Of course, a fuel scoop could be used for salvage, as well as topping up their fuel banks by sun skimming, so it was a good investment, even at 100 credits over the odds. Alex ordered one. Delivery and fitting would take 20 hours, a standard day. Alex fueled the ship next and stocked up with Zizorian delicacies. They had 320 galactic credits left with which to buy trade stock, an uncomfortably low sum. On the other hand, their ship now had extra defensive shields, four directional targeting of lasers and missiles, an anti-missile system and a fuel scoop. They were more than halfway to becoming a battle cruiser. Alicia scanned the planet's market list with Alex. For all that Zizorians liked exotic things, they had precious little to offer. Two narcotics were available. Arcturan burstweed and, strangely, tobacco. Alex thought hard about them. Surely we could get away with tobacco? Uh-uh, Alicia murmured. No way. Nicotine's deadly, even in low doses to many races. If we carried it to a human world, it's still too risky. Minerals were on offer, but were pricey. Duracion, one of the ores that could be refined and time-stressed to give duralium for ship hulls, was available at eight credits to the ton, and that would sell exceptionally well at Lave, but Lave was many light years away now. And any Dura ore could bottom out on a standard day when a richer ore was found. Too risky. Gemstones, there were maroon and silver spectinals for sale, and red and green emerons. A pirate convoy would smell such booty from two light years away. As for the curiosity market, there were 200 fossilised Dironothaxorian life bones on offer at 40 credits each. Ever heard of them? Alicia asked. Alex said, I I've seen one and heard one in a museum on my home world. They sing. They're over 40 million years old and still they sing, waiting for something, a hatching or a change of climate, the bones from the pelvic region, so they could be incubation pods. Nobody knows. Are they valuable? Very. Exactly by how much, I don't know. Check it for restrictions. Malix did so. There were no known import restrictions or potential legal violations involved in trading in these fossilised animal bones. Better than food, Alex said. Any day, Alicia agreed. So we go for it? I suppose so. But as Alex began to key into the trade centre to purchase the goods, the console flashed the words, Incoming message. Raf, Alex said. And Alicia too seemed excited at the prospect of seeing and talking with Raf Zetter again. But it was not the wizened, crusty old space trader who had appeared on the screen as Alex accepted the call. Nothing like. It was a human being and not a humanoid alien that faced them, but... 
What had happened to its face was beyond description. There were many ways to change ordinary human looks to nightmarish caricatures of the same. Flying too close to certain stars, being exposed to the interstellar vacuum too often, working in certain ore and mineral mines. But Alex, as he stared at the dumpy grey swellings that swathed this person's flesh, could not imagine what grotesque disaster had befallen the caller. Lips like quivering gossamer wings trembled in the grey flesh. A hand, skeletal and crippled, shot through with bright red blood vessels, touched the wispy ginger hair that grew in a bizarre floral circle round the deformed head. Are you Ryder? The voice, at least, was normal and male. Identify yourself, caller. Ignoring the question, the other man went on. What are you trading in this time? Minerals? Specialities? What's it to you? Whatever it is you're thinking of buying, I can do you a better deal. I wouldn't trade with you if I was running hot from a supernova. The human grinned. Also, oh, it's eaten. Raph Zeta would. How come you're so fussy? You know Raph? Alex asked, perturbed and puzzled by the grotesque man's invocation of the friendly name. Me and half the universe, the deformed man, leaned closer to the monitor. His features filled the screen totally. Parasites. I'm sorry? These things, these this. Tapping his face. Parasites, spider worms. I did a stint in the pen on Dijkstra's world and the little buggers took a liking to me. These are the larva, about two million of them. They'll hatch out in about ten years, and that'll be the end of me. I sort of hope I'm at a dinner party with someone I don't like at the time. But you can't plan for these things. I, I don't blame you for not trusting me. Pale eyes glittered from beneath the heavy, pulsating folds of grey flesh. But don't judge by appearances. Alex. It is Alex, isn't it? I mean, for hell's sake, tell me if I've got the wrong number. I'm Alex Ryder. And I'm Patrick McGreevy. I'll say just two things to you. The first is this. When you kill the snake, you'll lay a ghost that's haunted me for more than five years. I'm not a flyer. What I am doesn't matter. There are more people like me than all the sunflower seeds you've traded in your life. People who need vengeance. People who can't do it for themselves. Kill the snake and you'll do a service to us all. Alex couldn't help the wry smile that touched his lips, even though he'd rarely felt less like smiling. He felt as if he was being manoeuvred, manipulated, like a robot ship, an auto-remote, programmed to fly in endless, mindless circles. What the hell was going on? He was Jason Ryder's son, and until three months ago, his best combat experience had been in a sim combat trainer. His pilot's license had hardly dried, and somehow... Despite all this, he'd been chosen as nemesis to exact a savage revenge from a ship that was certainly far more than a simple and simply deadly pirate. There were people watching him and waiting on him, their fingers crossed, their breath held. Why him? Why him and Delicia? OK, he said quietly, I get the message. You said... Two things. Right. Raf told you to trade in Shanna Skilk fur as soon as you could afford it. Am I right? He was right. It was one of Raf's last pieces of advice to Alex, and Alex had not forgotten it. McGreevy went on. When Raf told you to do that, he was sending you to me. You've got to get an iron ass. You've got to trade in something really worthwhile. Unship and fly across to South City, to the private traders' centre in the Magellan building. I've already got an iron ass, Alex said. No, you think so, do you? Do it anyway. Take a chance. Make your way to the Magellan building, South City. After a moment's hesitation, and with a glance at Alicia, who just shrugged and nodded, Alex agreed. A Coriolis station is nothing less than a vast city built on six planes and spread around the wide, empty sky of its interior, 
facing inwards from South City, the roof on the world, is North City. At night, the lights that glow above your head are the lights of streets and buildings. Alex checked out of the ship's berth and took a sky taxi across the void. The tiny automatic ship slid delicately and smoothly between the incoming and outgoing ships. Alex watched in fascination as the towering buildings of South City dropped away below and the grey sky edged closer. To his left, he could see the pattern of streets and parklands on the inhabited plain known as Commander City. Facing the entrance to the station, on that particular level, lived the high-ranking officials and various planetary envoys and ambassadors. They enjoyed a landscape which included lakes, rivers and ski slopes with real snow. Below him, the nemesis became a tiny dart shape on the broad landing pad. Above him, the towering offices and living blocks reached down towards him like geometrical stalactites. There was an abrupt moment's disorientation and suddenly the roof was the ground and now the nemesis was a single winking light in the heavens. The taxi dropped swiftly to street level between the grey and black monolithic structures. Lights of different colours blinked and shone. When the atmosphere began, a strange dusty shimmer seemed to envelop the city. The streets were crowded here, and it took Alex only moments to realise that the south city of this particular Coriolis station was the downtown area. Illegal trade abounded in narcotics, robots, slaves, sensuous stims, prostitution and frozen organs. Spacers walked slowly, cautiously, most of them still wearing near full suit, a certain sign that this was the rough quarter. Hookers of all sectors, the galaxy counted 17 at this time, and racers, mostly humanoid, solicited from hovering platforms, ready to escape fast from any overwhelcoming, unwelcome client. Advertising hoardings here were almost completely devoted to proclaiming the illicit pleasures which were available in South City. Police cars and remotes roared overhead, as did medships. The streets were alive with noise and bustle and filth. The Magellan Building, a dark squat cube, sat amongst this confusion like a great brooding monster. It had no visible windows. Lifts rose and fell on its outer walls, slow-moving green lights that gave it an uncanny sense of being alive. Alex had come without a hand weapon, and now began to regret it. Practically everyone, and everything, he saw carried a gun. In contradiction of Orbit's space law, he walked cautiously through the crowds of reptiloids, cloaked amphibioids, armoured insectoids, squat, bristling felines and the grotesque robotanks in which things which looked like giant mollusks or worms or branches of heather moved within the safety of their own environments. He entered the Magellan building and noticed the stench for the first time. The combined body odours of a thousand alien life forms. Surprisingly, some, those who drank raw methane gas, managed to excrete sweat that smelled as sweet as apple blossom. But most did not. The private trading centre was a vast hall, surrounded by the entrances to offices and warehouses. What was sold in this crowded, noisy place was anything that was considered too risky or bizarre or commonplace to sell on the open market. The trader who loaded up his cargo bay from a private purchase had better check with the planet's export monitoring system before leaving, or his reception at the other end might be a little bit more violent than he'd expected. Alex scanned the high walls for a hint of McGreevy's warehouse. As he did so, he found himself standing behind two tall, violent-looking insect forms, their bodies armoured in light grey their faceted eyes swivelling to stare at him as they talked together, cellis array clashing and clacking in their peculiar mode of communication. Alex stepped away, heart beating, blood rushing to his head, compound eyes, jointed limbs, head antennae, double cutting jaws. Thargoids, here on a space station. Thargoids were deadly. Thargoid spacers had had their fear glands removed and were considered to be the most effective and potent of humankind's enemies. The bounty for killing a Thargoid was huge, and for capturing and delivering the juvenile form, the Tharglet, to any Space Navy research centre even greater. 
What were they doing here? The Thargoids chattered together and watched Alex coldly. Alex noticed that each had an appendage resting on its thoracic plate where they holstered their hand lasers. Back off, a voice whispered, and Alex turned. McGreevy stood there, blinking through his deformities. Alex had not grasped how short the man was. He only came up as far as Alex's chest. Thargoids, he whispered. Bullshit, McGreevy said, and dragged Alex away. They're Eresrians, and the one thing that can make an Eresrian deadly is being confused the way you've just confused them with their deadly enemies, the Thargoids. Check the thorax markings and the shape of the fourth joint on each hind leg before you jump to conclusions again. Alex followed McGreevy gratefully away from the whispering insects. McGreevy's warehouse was small, cramped and smelly. Alex followed him through into the dimly lit interior and felt a pang of discomfort as the grotesque little man closed the doors behind them. In several large transparent crates, peculiar creatures shuffled, murmured, excited at the sudden disturbance. Are these what you have to offer? Alex asked in a low voice. McGreevy chuckled. He walked over to the nearest crate and brought up the light to illuminate more clearly the odd creature within. Alex stared. The creature was vaguely familiar, but the memory refused to come. It had a thick shell, patterned neatly, and limb holes at regular intervals around its bony house. For the moment, the beast was securely hidden within its protective environment. What are they? My mirths. McGreevy said. If they seem familiar, it's because they're astonishingly like an animal of old earth. The tortoise, as I believe it was called. These things have two heads, four legs, uh, and two anterior organelles that seem to serve no purpose. They're named for the planet of their origin, Mimurth, but you'll be shipping them to Sirag. The Siragians have a special relationship with the Mimurth. They eat them? Alex guessed. They worship them, McGreevy corrected, with a twitch of his flimsy lips. Worship? McGreevy nodded to the Sirag race. The Mimurth are the reincarnation of gods, a particular sort of god called an avatar, the animal form of a god. The Mimurth look very like the legendary avatars of Siragian religion and mythology. They're from another world, of course, and have no connection with Sirag at all, but any Siragian family will give a small fortune to have a living Mimurth in its temple. Alex was fascinated and intrigued. The bulky creatures moved sluggishly about, their fleshy pink limbs emerging from the shells to propel them through the slush that filled their cages. How much is a small fortune? Each of these will fetch a hundred credits, maybe more, and I have Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight hundred credits. That'll buy you all the shields and weaponry you need. Why not trade them yourself? McGreevy laughed sourly. With my record, you must be joking. No thanks. It takes me half a standard year to get a pen full of these things, and Raf Zeta usually has a customer for me. Someone like yourself who needs credit fast to perform a certain act of violence. Alex found himself staring at the bright eyes of the hideous face before him. He was no longer overly conscious of the deformities or of the pulsating life that existed just below the man's skin. He was aware only that he wanted, needed, to trust this acquaintance and wrath, and yet didn't. Make me an offer I can't refuse, McGreevy said, and hard reality hit Alex again. He said, 300. McGreevy chuckled and shook his head. The idea is, you make the profits. You won't do that offering me three times what you're likely to make from my mirth. I meant 300 for the lot. For a second, McGreevy stood in silence, staring at the younger man. Is this a joke? No joke. I have 300 credits in the world. You've got the wrong boy, McGreevy. You just sold a cargo load of Shanna Skilk fur. And I bought weapons and a field scoop. I bought the furs at a loss to begin with. I'm no trader, McGreevy. I'm a combatier. I did tell you. Alex looked down at the Mimurth. I'll buy eight off you. How's that? I sell the lot, or not at all. I want 1,500 credits for them. Raf said you'd come through. Raf was wrong. 
shift them through some other sucker. Alex turned to go. Regrevy's whimper of panic was almost funny to hear. I saved these things up for Raph. Who else is going to trade in my mirth? I'll take ten off your hands for three hundred credits. The more you stall, the less I'll offer. Alex was enjoying this. I need to shift the lot to Sirag. Where was Sirag? Alex wondered. It was not a name that rang any bells. Then you'll have to trust me, he said. Like you trust Wrath. I'll give you a down payment of 300 against one third of what I get at Sirag. I'll come back and pay you off. McGreevy stared at him in silence. The man's breathing was laboured. One third will hardly cover my outlay. 50%. 40%, Alex said. And no further bargaining. The Mimurth shuffled anxiously. McGreevy shrugged with defeat. He summoned the vid witness and the two men signed the agreement. 28 my mirth for sale to Sirag, 40% of the proceeds to be returned to Pat McGreevy at South City, Coriolis 7, Xizor. If McGreevy was right, and the money was forthcoming from the religious nutcases on Sirag. Where was Sirag? The Nemesis could be equipped with beam lasers, extra missiles, extra shield energy banks and an energy bomb and the hunt could begin in earnest. Alex returned to his ship to report on the day's trading. Mm -hmm.